Occurring between 1665 and 1666, the Great Plague wasn't exactly the first time London had experienced such a terrifying spread of disease, with periodic cases being reported in the city for decades up to this point, and of course, that time about two-thirds of China's population, and a decade later about half of Europe's, including an awful lot of people from jolly old England, up and died during the Black Death. Nevertheless, the Great Plague was certainly noteworthy. According to the Bill of mortality from that year, in 1665 alone, 68,596 deaths occurred in London as a result of the plague. However, it is generally thought that this number is drastically under-recorded, as the likes of groups like Quakers did not report their death tolls, and many poor were simply dumped into mass graves without their deaths being recorded. This latter point is particularly significant, as many of the more affluent city members left London when the plague broke out, including King Charles II and his entourage, who left the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Lawrence, to deal with the plague while the King and the court retired to Salisbury. They possibly brought the plague with them in the process as it broke out there shortly afterwards. Once this happens, the King and court retired to Oxford to wait it all out. In the end, somewhere between 25 to 50 percent of the population of London died as a result of the plague during 1665 to 1666. With everybody dropping like flies and nobody knowing what was causing the plague in the first place, this led to some interesting methods of preventing it spreading, as we'll get to in a moment. So how did it all start? Well, this was one of many waves of bubonic plague that had literally been plaguing much of the developed world for a few centuries up to this point off and on. We now know that the plague was generally transmitted via fleas that carried strains of Yersinia pestis microbes that they had picked up via rats. As for this specific iteration of the plague around London, the first recorded instance was just outside of the city in a parish known as St. Giles in the Fields, sometime early in the spring of 1665. Soon after this, the number of reported cases and the death toll rapidly increased until it reached its peak in the summer of the same year, during which thousands of Londoners were dying each week. In fact, the death rates became so severe that daytime collection of bodies was banned as those in charge feared a mass panic if people were to see the massive amount of bodies being carted off by dead cart drivers and dumped into mass graves every day. One such mass grave was found to house 1,114 bodies being dug down until the grave diggers hit the water table at about 25 feet. However, this daytime ban didn't work out at all because there were simply too few dead cart operators to keep up with carting away all of the bodies just at night. As a result, it was common for people to stack the bodies in the streets rather than wait for a dead cart driver who had room on his cart. With rotting corpses literally piling up, the ban on daytime collection was lifted. As you can imagine from all of this, fear ran rampant and terrified Londoners tried anything and everything possible to ward off the disease. As mentioned, since the actual cause of the plague was still a mystery at this point, many of these preventative measures were either useless or harmful in and of themselves. For instance, it was a common idea back then that the plague was caused, or at least facilitated, by bad air. As a result, besides bonfires being kept burning throughout the city at all times by order of the authorities, and homes also having their fires going day and night regardless of outside temperature, many took to smoking tobacco as a way of keeping the air going into their lungs free of disease. This led to a rather surreal situation in which people of all ages, including children, were essentially forced to smoke or start smoking if they hadn't previously. For instance, A.J. Bell wrote a few decades after the plague, For personal disinfections, nothing enjoyed such favor as tobacco. The belief in it was widespread, and even children were made to light up a reef in pipes. Thomas Hearns remembers one Tom Rogers telling him that when he was a scholar at Eton in the year that the Great Plague raged, all the boys smoked in school by order and that he was never whipped so much in his life as he was one morning for not smoking. It was long afterwards a tradition that none who kept a tobacconist shop in London had the plague. And if you think that's weird, how about the time when people commonly blew smoke up a person's ass to save them from drowning, including equipment for the procedure being hung along major waterways like the Thames, much like AEDs are today, and we've got more on that in the bonus facts in just a bit. Other more sensible preventative measures, including cleaning money in vinegar before handing it to a shopkeeper, not letting those same shopkeepers touch raw food with their bare hands, and wearing dead toads around your neck. Another thing that London 
Londoners believed helped spread the plague was the many stray cats and dogs that roamed London streets, so much so that an official edict from King Charles II stated that no swine, dogs, cats, or tame pigeons be permitted to pass up and down in streets or from house to house in places infected. As a result, many thousands of these animals were killed and promptly burned or buried. While, in some sense, they weren't exactly wrong on this one, the dogs and cats carried fleas that may or may not have been previously infected with the offending microbes, this nonetheless is generally thought to have had a net effect of helping the plague staying power as the stray cats and dogs formerly helped keep the more worrisome rat population somewhat in check. Perhaps the most extreme thing Londoners did back then to help curb the spread of disease was quarantine any house that had been host to a plague victim by sealing it shut for 40 days. The doors to those houses would be locked and then marked with a huge red cross, above which the words, Lord have mercy upon us, would be scrawled. To ensure that nobody escaped, a guard would also often be posted outside. Since it was common to seal a house with all of the occupants still inside, regardless of whether they were sick, many Londoners took to bribing the guards tasked with searching homes for signs of the plague to ignore any such sign in their home, which is one of the reasons records from that era are so lax. When this didn't work, some resorted to fleeing their homes and all their possessions before their house could be sealed, choosing to risk living on the street rather than succumb to plague or starve to death locked away. Even when a house was bolted shut and placed under the watch of a burly guard, there were still a number of escape options available to an enterprising occupant. One of the most popular and straightforward escape methods was to simply convince the guard to temporarily leave his post, usually via a bribe. Some of the more clandestine escape methods from the time included tunneling to freedom, enlisting the help of friends to poison or drug the guards, and stealthily making a daring rooftop escape at night, sort of like a plague-ridden ninja. Other, less subtle methods of escape included punching through the thinnest walls of the property to the outside world, or setting fire to the building and escaping in the confusion. In at least one case, a man used a makeshift explosive crafted from fireworks to blow up his front door as he and his entire family leapt from a first-story window to escape at the same time. It turns out, going out the window wasn't necessary, though the blast had killed the guard. Arguably the most ingenious method of escape was to essentially go fishing for guards. In this method, the occupants of the house would carefully lower a noose from windows to settle around the necks of the guards outside their homes and either drag them upwards to their death or just choke them until they surrendered their keys. In the event of the former, the guard's body would then be discreetly disposed of by wrapping it in a sheet, thereby disguising it as the body of a plague victim, which nobody would check very closely, and then dumping it unceremoniously into a passing dead cart. Amazingly, it's noted that at least a score of guards, about 20 to you and me, were killed in this way by desperate citizens. Luckily for both citizens and guards, the worst of the plague passed by the fall of 1666, and absolutely nothing terrible happened to London ever again. Unless you want to count the huge fire that tore through the city just a year later, destroying approximately 85% of the walled area of the city, leaving about 65,000 people homeless. It also destroyed an awful lot of records concerning the recent plague, making it difficult to nail down things like the exact death toll and how many people were infected but ultimately recovered. Then, of course, there were all the other times horrible things happened in London throughout its very eventful history, but I mean, who is counting? And now for a bonus fact. Going back to blowing smoke up your bum, as alluded to, back in the late 1700s, doctors literally blew smoke up people's rectums. Believe it or not, it was a general mainstream medical procedure used to, among many other things, resuscitate people who were otherwise presumed dead. In fact, it was such a commonly used resuscitation method for drowning victims particularly that the equipment used in this procedure was hung alongside certain major waterways such as the River Thames, equipment courtesy of the Royal Humane Society. Society. People frequenting waterways were expected to know the location of this equipment, similar to modern times concerning the location of defibrillators. Smoke was blown up the rectum by inserting a tube. This tube was connected to a fumigator and a bellows, which, when compressed, forced smoke into the rectum. Sometimes a more direct route to the lungs was taken by forcing the smoke into the nose and mouth, but most physicians felt the rectal method was more effective. The nicotine in the tobacco was thought to stimulate the heart to beat stronger and faster, thus encouraging respiration. 
perspiration. The smoke was also thought to warm the victim and dry out the person's insides, removing excess moisture. So, how did all of this get started? The Native Americans were known to have used tobacco in a variety of ways, including treating various medical ailments, and the European doctors soon picked up on this and began advocating it for treatments for everything from headaches to cancer. In 1745, Richard Mead was among the first known Westerners to suggest that administering tobacco via an enema was an effective way to resuscitate drowned victims. By 1774, Drs. William Hawes and Thomas Cogan, who practiced medicine in London, formed the institution for affording immediate relief to persons apparently dead from drowning. This group later became the Royal Humane Society. Back in the 18th century, the society promoted the resuscitation of drowning people by paying four guineas, about £450 today by purchasing power, or $756 to anyone who was able to successfully revive a drowning victim. Volunteers within the society soon began using their latest and greatest method of reviving such half-drowned individuals via tobacco smoke enemas. Artificial respiration was used if the tobacco enema did not successfully revive them. In order that people could easily remember what to do in these cases, in 1774, Dr. Holston published a helpful little rhyme. Tobacco, glyster, enema, breathe and bleed. Keep warm and rub till you succeed and spare no pains for what you do may one day be repaid to you. The practice of using tobacco smoke enemas on drowning victims quickly spread as a popular way to introduce tobacco into the body to treat an array of other medical conditions, including headaches, hernias, respiratory ailments, and abdominal cramps, among many other things. Tobacco enemas were even used to treat typhoid fever and during cholera outbreaks when patients were in the final stages of the illness. In their most rudimentary form, tobacco smoke enemas were not always administered with the aid of bellows. Originally, the smoke was blown up the victim's rectum with whatever was handy, such as a smoking pipe. Of course, such close contact wasn't exactly ideal, and if the rescuer accidentally inhaled instead of blew, let's just say things that one should not aspirate could be aspirated. If the person jerked around, mouth contact was also a risk, even more risky, considering the person being administered was sometimes diseased. In fact, one of the earliest documented references of using such a tobacco enema to resuscitate someone came from someone using a smoking pipe in 1746. In this case, the man's wife had nearly drowned and was unconscious. It was suggested that an emergency tobacco enema might revive her, at which point the husband of the woman took a pipe filled with burning tobacco, shoved the stem into his wife's rectum, and then covered the other ends of the pipe with his mouth and blew. As one would imagine, hot embers being blown up her rectum had the intended effect, and she was indeed revived. The practice spread quickly, reaching its peak in the early 19th century, before, in 1811, English scientist Ben Brody, via animal testing, discovered that nicotine was toxic to the cardiac system. Over the next several decades, the popularity of literally blowing smoke up someone's ass gradually became a thing of the past. Figuratively, though, this practice is still alive and well. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out another channel I do called Geographics? It's geography videos, obviously, linked to below. And thank you for watching.